Hello, and welcome to the 15th episode of Coffee and Cocktails. I'm your host, Dr. Ann Wand. On today's show, we will be untangling the mysteries surrounding the infamous Krampus. Our guests today include Dr. Matthias Ress from the Max Planck Institute, Gertrude Sizer from the University of Vienna, and Al Reidenauer, author of The Krampus and the Old Dark Christmas. Thank you all for joining us. Hi, Ann. Hi, Ann. Pleasure. As per usual, we'll start off by having you tell us what drink you're having for the show, followed by a little bit about yourself. Al, would you like to start? Uh, I'm still having coffee. It's early here. Early bird. It's 8 a.m., isn't it? Yes. Well, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, Al? Uh, I am, I'm also a podcaster right now. Um, I do a podcast called Bone and Sickle that kind of grew out of my... Uh, uh, Krampus research. Uh, it's uh, the topic is uh, sort of the intertwining of folklore and history and the uh, darker, darker things, the horror genre. I usually say mm. so. All the process is fairly familiar, though. I don't do call-ins. It's more of a, uh, I would say it's an illustrated lecture, but it's uh, it illustrated with audio, with sound and music, and so it's uh, sort of a cross between uh, a lecture and storytelling. I was going to say, I've listened to quite a few of your episodes, and it is kind of like being transported to like old school radio theater. It's pretty fun. Thanks, I enjoy it. That's yeah. the idea. <laughs> yeah. uh, and Gertie, how about yourself? What are you having this afternoon? Oh, what I do this afternoon? Oh, like drinking. Uh, drinking water. Just drinking, just drinking. Pure on, just drinking. Yes. Drinking water. And uh, preparing myself for the podcast because my English is so bad. You hear it? Oh, your English is, your English is fine. <laughs> and yeah, um, and normally on Saturdays I always have to fix up my um, my homework because it's the only day in the week where I can do this. <laughs> so I always have to. So we're adding up. another layer of stress to your Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Matt, how about yourself? Um, I'm also having water right now. Um, for it's. But it's 5 p.m. in Vienna. Yeah. Um, I am. I just came uh, to Vienna from uh, from Dorfkastein, actually, uh, a place that might I don't know come up later during our conversation about the Krampus, where I grew up and where my parents have a farm. And um, yeah, it just so happened that this was kind of a, a inconvenient coincidence to come to Vienna, say hi to Gerti, and uh, do this recording here in town. Good. Well, I hope you're ready. And then tomorrow I'll go back to Germany where I where I work at this uh, at the Max Planck Institute. Fantastic. Well, I figure we might as well just jump in um, before we even talk about Krampus, Krampus, however you want to say it. Could you tell our listeners what is mumming? Don't all jump in at once. M U M M I N G. What is mumming? I know, Al. Oh, you talked about know. that quite a bit in your book. <laughs> yes, we don't. We don't really have that here in America. I'm in Los Angeles, by the way, um, and where we certainly don't have it. Uh, you uh, you do have some remnants of it in England. I was just in England recently and saw some uh, classic mumming in uh, the Cotswolds uh, on day after on uh, day after Christmas, Boxing Day. Uh, we it it is a sort of it's used used often as a sort of general description of costumed. Uh, holiday processions. Usually there's some simple uh, play acting involved. There's very short play usually. And usually that's in rhyme. And uh, money is often collected. I would say almost always collected at the end, money or some sort of gift. And so the Krampus thing kind of uh, is related to that in that people originally would go house to house. And in the old days, there was even some, there were even some scripted bits that they would say. So it's kind of used as a kind of catch-all handle for these sort of processional costumed uh, holiday traditions, usually around Christmas, but also uh, Easter are the, the main the main days. Because hmm. I, I would say, I mean, Halloween's kind of the quickest or like the, the closest comparison that I can think of. Um, and unlike other people who just give kids uh, candy, when m the kids come to our house and say trick or treat, I make them do a trick before they can get a treat. But that's beside the point. How would you describe mumming in terms of the traditions that are pretty common? When do they happen most likely in places like Austria and Germany? Um, I think it would be, um, I guess, starting with around Halloween, going all the way to Mardi Gras. That would be the mm. uh, the long carnival, basically. The like whole, a four-month-long carnival. 
Yeah, um, and when you kind of when you when you look at the whole kind of continuum of of mask uh, customs in in the Alps and in Central Europe, I think and that's the interesting thing. You find um, you will find different events in different places at throughout this this time. So I, I don't think there is any place where you have four months of carnival, but um, looking looking at it from a bird's eye view, yes, that's that I think is is good to say from early November to till. March. March. Okay. Well, how did the three of you become interested in Krampus? Because I know, Gertie, you said you kind of knew it from the periphery. And I know, Matt, you actually participated. And Al, it's just a big, giant question mark. I have no idea. So how did the three of you get involved or even become interested in this event? I'll let the natives speak first. Let the natives? Okay. We'll let the ladies speak first. Gertie, you want to go? Okay, so I didn't know a lot about Krampus from my home village. I come from Upper Austria, the Mühlviertel, and there it is. It, it, we only have this form where uh, uh, the Nikolaus, together with the Krampus, go from uh, from house to house and uh, punish the bad children and and give candies and things like that to the good ones. Only we only know this form. And uh, in Vienna, the Krampus is uh, really so unusual, especially among intellectuals. I have never heard and seen here a Krampus. And when I started, um, when I met uh, Matt, uh, uh, then he uh, told me about these very, very fascinating masks in the Gastein Volley. And so we decided to do a kind of field school uh, like, uh, w together with students there. Mm. So I got involved and I was really uh, completely astonished that uh, such, uh, yes, there is something like this in Austria. I was completely, yes, um, um, astonished and then completely fascinated. So I got addicted to them. Interesting. And Matt, you you were Saint Nick himself, weren't you, at one point? Ah, uh, yes, that was that was my <laughs> claim to fame. And I was 17. So kind of maybe, yeah, maybe to put them in perspective, I grew up in in one of the in one of these very in one of the very few valleys where there is like a really long tradition uh, of and when you when we look at contemporary uh, Krampus practices, um, at least when we're talking about a hundred or maybe two hundred years there, and um, and it's very common for for teenage boys when they're like sixteen, seventeen to form uh, a troop to kind of come up with their own name to kind of make the small the small. Um, I, normally, it's a group of friends that come together and decide we'll uh, we'll form a new troop, and that's what what I did with a few friends. Uh, and so one year, the first year, I was uh, I was Saint Nick, and then. And I left for for university, and um, unfortunately, never really um, made it back to the to the active part of it. But then, um, with Gerti, my my teacher at university, then we kind of we returned as as uh, ethnographers to to the practice a few years later. Fantastic. You know, it's it, it's a bit embarrassing, but actually, it's quite great because when I was reading your article for the second time, because uh, the listeners won't know that you guys we worked on a joint sort of publication a journal. I started picturing Matt in St. Nick's outfit and then it just created a whole new perspective to your article when I looked over it a second, third, third right. time. Um, Al, how about yourself? What made you travel to the Alps to learn about this particular phenomenon? Well, like a lot of Americans, I heard more. Well, let me go back a bit. My, my family, a couple generations back, is German, not really from the part of Germany where they have the uh, Krampus tradition, but there are related customs in Germany. So um, I was sort of raised with some interest in German culture. I did. And then in uh, high school, I learned German. And then I went on in the university to study German language and literature. And all the while I had an interest, I, I always had an interest in um, folklore and mythology. And the other thing that fed into that was uh, I, uh, I was always a horror film. Fan. <laughs> I like, I like the horror genre, I like horror literature. And, um, the so those two things kind of cross there, and then also, I I do sculpt and paint, and so the the craft of the craftsmanship of the masks and the costumes was very appealing. I came out, uh, ended up in a, in Los Angeles, and worked in the film production 
area for about 10 years when there's a lot of create, creative people here. So uh, it's sort of those three things, the interest in German culture, the, the four things, I guess, uh, the folklore interest, horror interest, five things, <laughs> the Spanish Inquisition, uh, five things, the, uh, and then uh, also the interest in the craft, craftsmanship and the horror genre. Anyway, those things came together. And then around the, two, the early 2000s, a lot of Americans uh, started uh, kind of hearing about the Krampus online. I had actually lived in Berlin for a while. I remember seeing these uh, beautiful lithograph postcards around Christmas of a devil head. And not quite, it's funny, not quite understanding what it was. I, actually, in those years, I was reading James Fraser's The Golden Bough, which is a... Oh, we know the Golden Bough. We know the Golden Bough. <laughs> Feel free to go over and oh. tell us, about, tell everyone else about it, though, by all means. Well, I was... I, I would read about, it was written at a time before the word Krampus was really in circulation. And, you know, there's a lot of outdated material in that book and a lot of outdated um, ideas and uh, theory, but he was able to write in a time when a lot of the customs at least still existed. So there was some, some ways closer to these sources. So I heard about these customs, but the, the word Krampus never appeared in the book. I didn't recognize that devil head, even back in the back in those days in Berlin, mm-hmm. but by the early two thousands, America the imagery of the Krampus, particularly the Krampus uh, postcards, had started circulating online. There was a collector in Chicago who had uh, amassed a bunch of these and published them in books, and those ended up scanned and circulating online. And then, not that much longer later, a video started circulating of actual um, uh, uh, Krampus runs, Krampusläufer in uh, Austria, and so seeing seeing not only these uh, sort of cartoon versions of the character, but these beautifully uh, fleshed out, detailed costumes and masks really caught my interest. And uh, so that I, uh, I had was working, I had lots of friends that were involved in creative stuff. And we basically, de- and we decided to start our own Krampus group here in Los Angeles in 2013, which was kind of audacious. Uh, certainly, if nothing else, the climate doesn't really lend itself to heavy fursuits. You would think and, Hollywood would be a little bit excited. But yeah, I could see having lived in Malibu, it could be a bit come and go. But yeah, go on. Well, we have we have that issue. But also the culture, you know, this is in America, the Krampus is a very different experience. And uh, I would say it might be closer to some urban areas in Austria and Germany where they don't have the, the traditions not quite as indigenous. It's sort of borrowed from other Alpine regions. So, but we are even further still from what, where, you know, where the source culture. So, uh, people came to this Krampus stuff that we started with, you know, very different ideas of what, what they were going to be doing. And, uh, well, if I could, kind of- yeah, if I could pause for just a second, cause I think, I think before, cause it's, is I, I love the passion. That's one thing I've noticed. Anybody who studies Krampus or isn't involved anyway, there's, there's kind of like a fire behind it. Like you said, Gertie, once you get into it, you sort of get addicted. But I think for those people, because there seems to be quite a few, I know the American audience in particular are just starting, you know, to get used to it. I know Amber Dorco Stopper, for example, does a big festival in Philadelphia, um, but it's still kind of like a new movement. For those who are just completely blank slate, they have no idea what this event looks like. Could you tell us, firstly, when does it happen? And you know, what, 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 what happens is that, you know, Santa Claus come down a chimney? Does he give gifts? You know, what does it look like? What is a Krampus troop? What do they consist of? You know, kind of create a picture for us on a traditional St. Nicholas Eve. What does that look like? Gertie, Matt comments. Hmm, that's, that's a very, very <laughs> tough question because, uh, the, because the practice is so incredibly diverse. Mm. So we would always have to and of course, I mean, pardon our ethnographers' uh, <laughs> comments here, but I guess we'd always have to localize uh, and kind of say who we are talking about, what place we're talking about. If we talk about these um, kind of rather traditional uh, Alpine communities in, in Austria, then you would normally, well, but it also it depends. Let's, if we talk about the Gastein Valley, let's start with my. At is completely different. Exactly. So if we start with Gastein, this is the normal troop is um, six to ten people, one Santa Claus, um, his basket carrier, um, maybe one, maybe two angels, and uh, women dressed in, in angel costumes, and five to eight maybe or maybe 10 Krampuses. Yeah, they, and the Krampus in this, in this particular um, 
um, place is normally is or they are, it, it, it's it's a highly uniform um, costume there. They all wear um, sheep fur. They wear big um, round um, rolls that are kind of so they're not really not like cowbells, but like really kind of rounded, um, very loud um, rolls that are that are filled with uh, uh, with metal with metal. Um, um, How big are we talking? Are we talking about uh, like two feet tall? Or we, we some of these the things can wear can weigh or be quite heavy, can't they? So the rolls are small. Like normally, uh, each Krampus will wear th- a, a belt with three or four of these rolls. So they are, oh, oh, but they're more like bells, right? They're not yeah, like because I'm thinking like bread cow. rolls. I'm thinking cinnamon buns. So we're we'll looking picture Swiss cowbells. Swiss cowbells. Okay, that helps. Thank you. Similar, yeah, similar mm-hmm. size. Often they are made from two um, steel helmets. Okay. Together. Um, and then, of course, the most important part of the costume is uh, a wooden mask with horns. Mm. So a mask carved from wood. Um, that has in Gastein between six and ten horns from so normally one pair of rams horns and three to five pairs of goat horns. Goat horns. And I think for the listeners, it's we're not talking like a Pinocchio mask here. This is like quite beautifully done, but quite grotesque as well. The distorted faces and the tongue coming out and sometimes gnashing teeth, depending on the artist's perspective. Is that correct? Absolutely, yes. And the, the, um, altogether, they, they wear around between uh, 20 and 25 kilograms. The mask are wow. between 5 and 7 kilos. And uh, once I, I, I had one on the head and it's, for me, it's it, it, I really got frightened because you get the feeling that if you if if, if it's not possible to to um, move your head. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it, they are really extremely heavy, and that all together the 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 fur everything together has around twenty to twenty five kilos, and the, the the young boys for them it is really very very um, um, a, a really hard job. A bodily, completely hard job. Hmm. I, I would say exactly, so. and that's that's the other important thing maybe to consider when we talk about these. As we said, these the most traditional form of it is that these troops go from house to house, often from hamlet to hamlet, and they 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 meet. And it's and in Gastein, it's normally it's two days. It's December fifth and sixth, and they meet in after, right after lunch at like two three p.m. Uh, get dressed. And then start walking, and they often and they w- walk and perform uh, until about 10, 11, 12 p.m. And then again for for a second day. Mm. Uh, so they often have like a route of I don't know 15, 20 uh, miles on 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 one evening. Yeah, and and some of these events, and I know Al, you talk about this quite a bit in your book, and you do a very very good job providing the reader with all sorts of examples. Both of you do. Um, is that it seems to me, and I and I base this having lived in South Tyrol, and I was in the more touristy areas, but um, the further out you go, uh, if you're in the touristy areas, everybody kind of has to mind their P's and Q's, be on their best behavior. But then the further out you go, it seems like the rules of security aren't enforced as much in that this idea of punishing bad children can lead to quite physical violence and i was wondering if you could elaborate a bit more about that what that what that means what that looks like i think that's actually somewhat the wrong context the house visits don't really that's not an element of those Mm. uh there is that maybe we should back up what uh, matthias described was uh the house visits uh and those involve children, are, right, and family, so it's quite a protected yes, environment. Family and child-oriented thing. Well, the whole family, different, uh, but the focus is the children mm. and and older, maybe young teens too. People who have not aged into the Krampus uh, age set, the late teens and twenties. Um, but so that's one phenomenon. The other, the other phenomenon that grew out of it, which is closer to what, for instance, we do in Los Angeles and what happens 
more in the bigger cities outside the more rural or more alpine areas is the Krampus Run. Okay. Uh, that grew out of this of these little group the the uh, practice of these little groups crisscrossing the smaller towns. So people might come out and see them on route from home to home. And in the Krampuses would still interact with the people that are out on the streets or out, you know, in the village or whatever. And so they might playfully attack more their age peers. Uh, so, so that's when it's, I, I wouldn't say you really, there's not really violence directed towards children. I, I think that's really a mi misconception. But, you know, occasionally uh, in certain areas in the Tyrol, I know it gets a little rougher during the Krampus runs. And that, again, is, it's actually sort of divorced from the, uh, the idea of St. Nicholas and uh, punishing the sort of mock punishment or playful, like chasing of bad children, quote unquote, bad children. So that's it's more a, a peer to peer uh, uh, thing where there's a little more people get a little rougher. There's certain. Yeah. And there are certain areas uh, in, in Tyrol where they actually <laughs> visitors aren't welcome. But, you know, very, very limited areas where they there has been instances of violence and things just getting out of hand. And it comes from both sides. It doesn't come. It comes as much from the audience. Mm. A lot of a lot of the people in the audience will be older boys who or older men who have either been Krampuses or want to prove that they are is just as tough as the Krampus. Who will push, try to push, and they'll try to get the Krampuses to chase them, and uh, it sort of becomes a game of one upsmanship. Do you agree with that, Matthias? I was going to say it sounds yeah. like a violent game of tag, but yes, continue. Yeah, it is actually. <laughs> But one, maybe one should add that, um, and I totally agree that there is, there is, I think there's very few inc uh, incidences of like direct physical violence towards children. But of course, there is a lot of, there's a lot of symbolic violence going on. There's a lot of, so uh, a lot of kind of old school black pedagogy is kind of, is enacted through, through the Krampus and through this idea of if, and, and I think it, I think it's less so than maybe a generation ago. But uh, when I grew up, this was still very common that people would say, if you, if you don't behave, um, uh, the Krampus will take you. Uh, you know, you wait and see in a month, the Krampus will come and then they'll, they'll, they'll take you along to their, mm. I don't know. It was no always a bit unclear where they came from, but somewhere from the forest, <laughs> somewhere from, the, from this liminal space outside of the village. Uh, maybe from a cave that was uh, somewhere up in the mountains. Well, I'll I'll tell you. So I have an aunt who's an adopted family member we've known for all our years, and she's the one that told me about the Krampus. And she told me of an instance where it backfired. And she was about two years old, and she was living, believe in the Tyrol. And her mother said, you know, if you don't behave, Krampus is going to come. And she was about two years old, so of course you get this boom, boom, boom at the door, and Krampus comes in, and he says, I hear that a little girl has not been eating her vegetables. And my aunt looked at the Krampus and then turned to her mother and said, he's so beautiful, can I keep him? <laughs> and then everyone burst into laughter and it defeated the whole point. So, you know, it gets back to that idea that, you know, with children, there's going to create a di different atmosphere. It's not going to be coming in and thrashing all the furniture. And not necessarily, though it does seem like historically that could have been the case depending on where you're from. Gertie, did you have anything to add? Yes, I have something to add because uh, when we think uh, on Gastein or Dwarf Gastein, then uh, and when the Krampus, the troop is on his way from uh, house to house, uh, normally the Santa Claus uh, and one or two Krampuses are entering the house and the other three to four or five are in front of the house and young girls in small groups um trying to chase them, to uh, annoy them, to uh, to get into interaction with them. And so the, the, the these sexualized uh, forms of behavior, this running and these forms of, 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 of really... Um, Kiss of tag, violence, that's what we called it growing they, up. They, they are on the streets, not in the houses and not in the interaction between small children and the grandpas yeah. and the Santa Claus. Uh, and and it, it, it is this whole day and um, on, on the on the streets where everything is that the action is really okay so it seems like there's a differentiation you had mentioned now as well that in the home it's more of a sort of safe place and it's this idea yeah. of you know making sure that you do the right things you make the right decisions and you know good things will happen to those who do the right things but then once you kind of step outside of the house the rules can change a bit there can be a bit more um chance for 
possible danger. I'll put brackets under danger because it doesn't necessarily mean that's the case. But um, again, under the cover of darkness, a lot more can sort of happen. Yeah, there are groups of, of girls um, between 14 and 20 uh, uh, years of age, and there, there normally are uh, three, four, five, six of them uh, always together, and they try to, to get beaten. <laughs> yes. They'll get, they'll get beaten up. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> no, I believe you. I genuinely believe you. Yeah. Um, we have heard also, like we, we did talk with, uh, with a lot of the school teachers there during our field work. And they said that the, that they 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 witnessed the girls comparing their their bruises the next day and kind of also to kind of to see who is who is the most uh, I don't know maybe the most attractive badass, the, the most, most wanted uh, attractive one right man I need to I need to find a new hobby but um there were some things to kind of change course a little bit um, Krampus. Again, it's an event. It's something that's celebrated from small, small age all the way up to adulthood. However, there are some things that both of you talk about in the in the research that you did about how there's more to this Krampus event that meets the eye in that it has links to gender, which we've always we've covered a bit, uh, fertility, issues of immigration, xenophobia, and possibly the far right with regards to white identity politics i know this is quite a loaded question but if we could just unpack it a little bit starting with you know let's start with with immigration something light um why do you think krampus would have a link to immigration how is that even related al would you like to make a would you like to start i think this is actually more of a question for the europeans (laughs) because uh our our Our, our group is, uh, and it's a very different setting. I will say just, and I'd like to hear what they have to say, our uh, Krampus activities are uh, very appealing, actually. We have a huge draw in the uh, Latin American community. Uh, so it's, there's no, I don't see any friction here, but I, I know that there are some stories from Austria that are different. So I'll, I'll, I'll defer to them for those. The- in, in, in every year, we have the, the, the discussions in the newspapers about this uh, um, about a heavily right wing uh, uh, Krampuses. In our experience, the, uh, uh, there are there are different k- uh, kinds of groups, and um, it's also uh, we we jokingly we didn't really scientific uh, call check this, but jokingly uh, we say that there there are ones. Uh, which say the origin of the Krampus is in this Celtic um, 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 history. The other ones say the origin in, of the Krampus is completely Germanic. Mm. And the third one say this is a, um, a Catholic um, um, invention of the uh, uh, 17th, 18th century. And uh, 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 there are too much Krampus troops to be um, that, that it's only one kind of political identity we can find. Uh, we have we have all the different parties in these Krampus groups uh, represented, and the ones with these Germanic origins, they uh, really um, uh, we, we we know of some of troops which are really quite dangerous and which try to beat up immigrants. Interesting. And we had uh, in Max Klan, uh, we had this, uh, and also th- there are also this, this, um, um, no, this, uh, we have some this, this urban legends. Uh, yeah, uh, there's this, this one uh, urban legend about the, the sorry. Yeah, but. No, there was this, there was this, and, and, it, and it seemed to have been kind of told and retold for, for, for years that uh, a Turkish immigrant, immigrant stabbed the Krampus to death. And so we had one of our master students who was also a journalist. She went through the whole archive of the Austrian press agency for like 20 years. And so if, if that had ever happened, we, we, we were really sure there would have been a press announcement for it, which of course she, she didn't find. Uh, but that story kept, and during that second uh, field school we did uh, in and around Salzburg, that story kept coming uh, to all the, that was like 15, 20 different uh, students. And they, they all came back with that same story. And it was always somewhere else. It was this classic kind of my uh, my cousin's friend story. Friend of so friend. He was there and he was in the troop afterwards. And then they, um, but 
in a way it is connected to a, um, a larger kind of cultural trope of the non-behaving Muslim immigrant mostly. Mm. The, this idea of, of and especially and it's often it's told through the story of there are these young um, teenage boys that are like hyper masculine and they feel um, extremely um, they're, they're, they're drawn towards the Krampus There's another hyper masculine figure. Uh, and then when they are there, they don't know the rules. So they, they throw stones at the Krampus. They, they get into fights with the Krampus. And of course, as Gerti said, once, as if, as soon as you wear the mask, you're actually much more vulnerable than you look, you, you look very dangerous, but actually the, 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 the person, uh, uh, underneath the mask is, is, is of course the most, uh, most in danger of, of, of serious injury. Um, so all of these stories kind of keep coming back about these about these young boys and often and, and immigrant boys who can't um, who don't know the the tradition, don't know the rules, and therefore are kind of are destroying the tradition. This is often the the idea that through these through these conflicts, then the authorities are kind of getting more and more. Um, through these stories, through these incidents, uh, the authorities become more and more alert about the Krampus, and the media media coverage is is also kind of has there's and there's very little nuanced media coverage as well. There's this this one kind of classic stereotype of kind of um, hillbilly rednecks that are that are kind of that get drunk and then do stupid beat up stuff. Everybody who is on the street, and then there's of course the other extreme of these are uh, these are the this is the living tradition of the Alps, and it's extremely important that we save mm -hmm. it. And this is also one of the reasons why we felt it's so important to write a book that is addressed towards a kind of a wider audience uh, that adds some ethnography and some nuance to uh, to to the phenomenon. Well, and I think this is interesting. I, and Al, I, I think you would understand where I'm coming from, uh, Americana to Americana here. This idea of uh, preserving traditions in fear of the other, right? And you get this in political forums, you get this in, in all sorts of, it manifests itself in different ways. And it seems like at least with the Krampus, you, you talk about both of you, or at least I know you guys do, Matt and Gertie, this idea of a reinvented tradition, Hobbsbaum's work, um, this need to sort of establish oneself, establish your ground, establish your roots and your traditions, and to make sure that they don't change because, you know, change could not necessarily be a good thing. And I think it's interesting that you can take basically um, a tradition that was immersed in sort of families coming together, and it can be used as a tool, a political tool, in response to things that might make people a bit uncomfortable or things that they might be afraid of. And I think that that is... Is is something that is is worth discussing? Um, Al, did you have any comments? Uh, <laughs> completely derailing the conversation for a moment. I, I want to point out one thing that uh, Matt said. Matt said that uh, might be confusing to listeners. Uh, he said that it, the uh, the Krampus himself is probably the one in the most danger. That what that means is if you've ever I've worn a Krampus suit and uh, it's very claustrophobic and you have very low visibility you can't move well so uh, that's that's what was meant by that uh, back to the more the point at hand there's that fine that's the sort of fine line or that gray area between cultural pride and uh, nationalism and nationalism ethno nationalism and, and and all of these all of these traditions this there's a long history of uh, in all of these uh, folk traditions of things being resurrected in the 19th century when when nationalism was sort of on the rise. People were, you know, the Grimm's collected their fairy tales as in, 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 in an attempt to sort of help define the German people. What was that about? So they're they're, they're often tied and, and they're often tied, you know, to these ideas and with with some justification. But uh you 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 do you do see it as a tool of exclusion at times, and it, you know it's particularly problematic with the Krampus uh, because you've put you've put a sort of mock violence right in the center of things. So as uh, Matt was saying, you know, if they don't know the rules, there are rules, but it's a very it's a very sort of subtle social game that's played with. They get to hit you, but only in a certain way, and you're supposed to respond in a certain way, and it's very 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 culture bound. 
So, I mean, it's, it's easily an area of misunderstanding. It's, it, it could, you know, it, it, I, can, I can see how it could, could become a sort of tinderbox. Hmm. Which, which then leads me to my next comment. Um, so what about women participating? Because this can be quite contentious as well. I mean, you said, so yourself, Gertie, that, you know, that the mask itself could be up to 25 kilograms. And that's just the mask. And we're not even talking about the giant bells and the fur coats. And you had said in your research about how some of the men had said, oh, you know, even the women had said, well, just the sheer weight of the costumes. There's no way a woman could be a Krampus. But I do. It does seem to be that there's more to it than that, that this has been a male bonding experience, that this is something that the men do to come together. And if you throw a woman into there, it might throw off the the tradition. Um, What has been your experience doing doing field work? How have been people's responses to that? There were some uh, some villages or towns or or, or troops. uh, They. uh, never would accept women as a grampus. And this, uh, this is really a kind of, of ideology, for instance, in the Gastein Bolle or in Matra in Eastern uh, Tyrol, they, they will accept no women. But on other places, uh, they, they, um, uh, they, uh, uh, women in the troops are very, very normal, and they ran uh, very naturally as grampuses too. It, uh, and they have no problem with them. So it, it is, um, we have to differentiate very much. And also the, the, this, um, this Gastein wallet, uh, they, they are famous for having, I think, the, the, the heaviest masks and, and, uh, of, of, of the whole uh, Alpine region. I think the, something like that. But because in, in, in other um, regions, the, the masks and, the, and, the, and also the furs and, and, and the, the, st- the stuff they wear, they are very light. So it's, it's not the question of, of uh, uh, that women are not able to do to, uh, these Krampus performances. Okay. And um, and in Matrai, uh, we had we made the experience that people told, uh, told us that it's absolutely not possible for women to perform as a grampus. But we, um, uh, in, a, in a master thesis I, I co-supervised now, uh, the, um, um, the grandmother of a young of a young woman in the in the 1920s 1930s was very very proud that she ran in Matrai as a grampus. Good for her. Good for her. And accepted by the beard, by the male beard, because it's not possible uh, to, 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 to hide um, without being um, yeah, detected. Interesting. Interesting. Also in, in Gastein, it was very common for women to, to be uh, St. Nick until the 70s. So it's, we also had the, and of course we don't have a, a lot of data on that, but it seems like uh, like there was a, a form of, of um, removing women from, from the Krampus tradition in, in the post-war era. And that before that, uh, or until like the 1960s, 70s, it was actually, it was not common for them to be Krampus, but I think on, occasionally they would also kind of become Krampus, maybe, maybe not for a whole day, but maybe for a few hours. Um, so there was always, a, a, there was always been a possibilities for women to, uh, to do it mm. and but of course now and we see that in many of the of the more urban troops it's it's becoming very very common yeah i will say um i know where i did a bit of field work in vipitano in south tyrol that their krampus group during world war ii they had to send a bunch of men out for obvious reasons and they needed men to play the role during that period of time so for a few years running the women dressed up as krampus but interestingly since then once the men came back the women stopped and they haven't had women since. So they actually gave me pictures of, of apparently the women. And you couldn't tell the difference. Black and white photos. Everybody dressed up in makeup. Uh, but yet for whatever reason, men came back and they said, right, you can't do this anymore. So it is interesting that even now there seems to be a bit of, of contention in terms of who can who can be the torchbearer, so to speak, and represent the, the community as opposed to others. Which leads me to my next question. There is a lovely lady by the name of Frau Perkta, as well as the Perkten, and I'm sorry I'm saying this incorrectly, but Al, you talk about how Perkten actually predates Krampus, which gets to this idea that, um, you know, 
you could say it's pagan, you could say it's not, it's debatable, but this idea of, of sort of a darker side to the holiday season is, um, it's been around for a while. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, there's the, the first mentions of that character occur around 1000, the year 1000. Uh, so it does go way, way back. The connection between, so uh, Frau Peshta is, uh, uh, grew into, uh, let's just say, in the beginning, it's a little unclear who's being referred to. Uh, she definitely seems to be associated with uh, witchcraft. Uh, and then later she grew into more of a bugaboo character that is uh, employed around Epiphany. Her name comes from an old Bavarian uh, term for Epiphany. Uh, and so it was very similar. Uh, th and this this sort of died out. Uh, but it was very similar for a character representing her in some some regions, as Matt said, that all of this is extremely regional and diverse. But in some regions, this character would come around uh, on Epiphany Eve uh, and sort of fulfilling the same function as the Krampus do, but more focused on the women of the household who they're uh, the housekeepers, but particularly uh, the spinners, people that would do spinning. And that would all need to be done and done correctly by Epiphany Eve or there were threats. Uh, this, uh, as far as like the, the costume, the, this is the myth that was told, the story that was told. As far as costumed embodiments and uh, representations of this, that's that was pretty rare. But um, this this character became sort of uh, sort of multiplied into. She was became identified with. Uh, in the beginning, she was the leader of a host of of figures like and dead children. Those, isn't that right? Children that weren't well, purgatory. Yeah, she uh, the, those who died before baptism, she took care of, and uh, so they were basically basically then she those became sort of generally ghosts. Those became in the Christian era because the it wasn't in line with the theology. Those became a leader of a horde of demons who became and those are the Pesht in the plural. They are like the Pesht, but the, uh, they they had they were more sort of uh, generic, and so then these Pershtian characters. Uh, were, would circulate through the towns in costume, and that could be represented in costumes uh, that looked like sort of were the forerunners of the Krampus. And those those uh, Pearson runs took place before there were Krampus runs. There was no attendant St. Nicholas, uh, and they were tended to be more wild. So uh, that's sort of the, her story and the Pearson story in a nutshell. Hmm. But uh, what you one thing I wanted to say when we were talking about women involved in these Krampus activities. There are also uh, through the Krampus activities are the first uh, the round St. Nicholas Day, but around uh, all the way up to Epiphany, you'll find Pershtin runs, uh, which, you know, to the outside observer would look very much like Krampus runs. But um, occasionally you'll also see. Uh, so a lot of those creatures, people in costume will look very much like Krampuses, but you also see women dressed as witches. And you'll see sometimes even women dressed as witches in the bigger cities coming along with the Krampuses, the two traditions are kind of merging, but that's another identity that women might assume along with wearing the sort of more, mm. I guess, masculine, traditionally masculine Krampus mask, you'll see women costumed as witches in the Pesta character. I know just from my getting responses to my book and my podcast and so forth is, is very popular with, with women. Uh, you, you mentioned Amber, Amber Dorco stopper in Philadelphia who would go, she went by Frau Paris, so that was her name for, for a while, nickname for an online name for a, a while. So uh, yeah, that character is really avidly embraced uh, among women who are interested in this tradition now. Okay. Uh, well, if I yeah. could, um, there's a lot going, I mean, like I said, we could unpack this for hours. I won't because I know Gertie needs to go to an opera, but um, it does seem like a lot of these traditions are, I, think, I guess the thing that's, that might blow some people away is that many winter celebrations, and we've only just covered two of them and very, very briefly are rooted in darker traditions. And Al, you say in your book that the darkness is essential to whatever magic is in Christmas. And I want to get your opinion on this. Why do you think some Western countries have shied away from these traditionally darker celebrations in favor of a more happy or should we say more consumerist tradition? Any thoughts, Matt and Gertie? Well, we discussed this question uh, <laughs> before and said, well, what are darker traditions? Because uh, the point uh, we uh, would like to make is that the, um, 
that this Krampus uh, runs for the for the youngsters involved, they are really something very, very fancy and it makes them happy. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, so there's a lot of happiness in the darkness. Yes, yeah, there's a lot of happiness in the darkness, and the, and that the, the, it's it's a kind of drinking and 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 mixing up the the, the gender are mixing up together, and it's it is is it is uh, fancy to them. So, mm. but what I what I do uh, agree with is that there is definitely a uh, an interesting form of anti-consumerism that is that is practiced. Uh, in many of these, in many of these areas, and um, so you mentioned briefly, uh, and we didn't talk about that too much. That tourism is very so. In most of these regions that have a strong Krampus tradition are uh, are deeply involved in in in, in the alpine winter uh, ski tourism, and so for the longest time, like the the local tourism boards have tried to co-opt uh, the Krampus troops into their you know, to have them. It would be very convenient to have them at like a season opening uh, event. So, like you know, we're talking about December six, five. This is basically the weekend or like the days before the, the, the lifts open. And until Christmas, it's always low season, so it's kind of it would always be nice to kind of get more people to come skiing early. Um, but time and again, and in many many villages, uh, the Krampus troops have been extremely resistant to that. They uh, have done all forms of passive uh, resistance against against these attempts. And I think about Hofkastein, they, they even had like a whole, like the whole market, uh, like the main street of the, of the, of the small town was um, kind of prepared by the tourism board and all the, Christ, uh, and all the Krampus troops went around uh, the high street. So they were like, they, nobody was there. So everything was kind of prepared for the big event, but, but nobody, not a single Krampus showed up. Um, so there, and Gerti has, and I think it was really great to work uh, together with Gerti as kind of an informed outsider who does not kind of come from this community. And, and she, she kind of, she really put that, put that um, um, thought also in my head that isn't this what, uh, isn't this the kind of the last, the last weekend, the last celebration before the tourists come? This is what the locals kind of, really vehemently try to defend and say, no, this isn't, this is for us. This is for the community. Whoever is around, we, we, I don't know, we won't kick out the tourists, but they can come and they can, and they can be part of it, but on our own terms, we will not, we will not turn it into an event for, for the tourism industry. Interesting. Al? There's a sort of exchange that happens in these events that's, uh, that's not, uh, it's not materialistic. It's it's. I, I do want to. I, I like very much what uh, Matt Aguirre was saying about the the happy or that both of them were saying about the sort of happy the the happiness and the joy that surrounds these these events. That's uh, it's a form of play, and uh, it's really unlike the sort of uh, this for that kind of gift exchange that we associate with Christmas. It's much more free form. It's much more unpredictable. It's uh, much more exciting, I think, than you know, people wrapping up gifts and counting off who who soft their list and who gave what, whom what. Uh, it's uh, m much more. It happens on the fly. It happens in the streets, and it's not. Uh, it's really not laid out the same way. It's not. It can't be controlled as as Matt was saying about you know, city fathers want to arrange it a certain way, but it's uh, this sort of spontaneous expression that's uh, you know brings brings. The whole everyone in the community a sense a sense of fun. It's as a city playing a game with itself, and it's a, a different kind a different kind of exchange. But I, I think it's more exciting to people than uh, than what we that has become predictable in uh, the sort of form that we inherited from like the Victorian Christmas the gift gift giving form. Well, and if I could, I, I kind of wanted to wrap up with a quote, Al, that you said in your book that I thought really kind of puts a positive spin on this idea of, of something that people might not be aware of. They see it as scary. They don't really understand it. They might not want to understand it. But one thing that you had said, Al, that really kind of stuck up to me in terms of how the tradition can, the Krampus tradition can actually benefit children and probably more so the larger communities. You say, even in larger secular Europe where St. Nicholas now more often judges children on performances of songs and poetic rec uh, recitations rather than 
catechism, his judicious positive comments and small gifts still engender the same sense of accomplishment and self-worth. The fear the child may experience in the face of hovering crompuses condemned by critics as mere cruelty can also be regarded as an opportunity to display bravery and a valuable rehearsal for a later real-world encounter. Um, do you have any closing comments that you would like to make? Because I think that really speaks to the benefits that can come from from a, a tradition that maybe allows you to sort of step outside yourself, even for just a, a brief period of time. I guess I, I have an example from uh, my observa observations when I was in Munich at a Krampus run. I Sort of that passage comes out of what I saw there. It, there was a child that was in the crowd as the Krampuses were uh, circulating through and approaching, and he was visibly shaking. He was really, really scared. And it's so much so that I think he attracted a lot of attention by the other spectators. And people ended up kind of watching the parents kind of encourage him to be brave and he can, shouldn't be scared. He should step. He can step forward and, and confront them. And I, so I literally saw this play out. He, the Krampuses, and when they drew closer, they kind of got a little bit lower. They, you know, made sort of made the confrontation <laughs> reduce it to a level that he could could accept. And he re, he reached out. He just shook hands with them. And then he just the smile that burst on that kid's face over that kid's face was everyone around was smiling because they saw the process. They saw the kind of pride that it brought him that he had confronted that and that that really was an important important to me understanding this tradition as a way that children can kind of take a step up and advance over something that held them back um, so uh yeah i mean that's i'm sorry i have an airplane flying over it looks like but yeah that that made a huge impression on me and that sort of showed me what one of the gifts of this tradition can be matt gertie any other final comments yeah, I think it's it, we have to differentiate uh, who is at rest because there are this this uh, the children at rest in in some of of uh, uh, cases and and are the 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 um, the young adults at rest because they they they, they are really different these are really different performances mm -hmm. and as far as I, I uh, read in this historical literature that uh, this um, um, the Krampus and the Nikolaus to to punish the the, the children who do, which don't want to 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 learn that this in, in Austria was uh, in Vienna it was first reported in in the time of Maria Theresia and it uh, it goes together with the introduction of the general uh, schooling obligatory obligatory schooling. So it, it's that uh, children should learn and it's not to, to, to recite the religion in this first step, but it, it, it was a, a kind of new pedagogy to uh, bring children to learn uh, reading and writing and in, in, in this um, 18th century, in the second half of the 18th century. And before, there is no evidence of this kind of Santa Claus and Krampus uh, going to children. But we have former evidence of uh, young masked um, uh, boys in the winter, in the Alpine winter time, running around and chasing uh, young women. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. I just want to say that's it from us at Coffee and Cocktails with your host, Dr. Ann Wand. I'd like to thank Dr. Matthias Ress, Gertrude Sizer, and Al Ridenauer for joining us at the studio this afternoon. For those of you who've enjoyed the show, please feel free to subscribe to our podcast as well as explore our Facebook page and blog. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter where you can learn more about upcoming episodes. Otherwise, that's it for now. Thanks for listening and have a great week.